Good morning. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sergei Kosakovsky Pond. So I've known him by name for maybe 15 years. That's the first time we meet face to face. I'm very happy uh, that you managed uh, to come here um, to see us at HITS. Um, so just some short notes about his CV. So he uh, studied cybernetics in Kiev. Uh, so that means computer science as an undergraduate. Then uh, he went to do a PhD in applied mathematics at the um, uh, University of Arizona at Tucson. And then for the following 13 years, he was first uh, a postdoc, then assistant professor, and then associate professor at um, the University of San Diego in California. And recently, I think this was like maybe three or four years ago, uh, he moved to Temple University where he's now a full professor. And he's probably, well, most well known for a software tool in the area of phylogenetics that is called HiFi and for work on, um, well, detecting positive selection in data. So, uh, Sergei, thank you very much for coming here and we're looking forward to your talk. All right. <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me. <clears throat> I had a chance to uh, walk through your beautiful city and I enjoyed, um, you know, riding here on the Autobahn where nice German automobiles are actually allowed to go the speed they're supposed to go. There was an RS7 that went in the fast lane, probably going 250 kilometers an hour, and it was amazing to see. Sorry, we have uh, very slow roads in Pennsylvania. They go back to uh, <coughs> the English colonists. They're all winding, and the speed limit is very, very slow. Um, so um, um, I will um, tell you today about um, you know, a slice of the work that we've been doing in, in the last you know, five to 10 years, uh, which is concerned with you know, developing statistical models for um, um, analyzing genetic sequence data in the modern um, era of quote unquote big data. Uh, so put together a retrospective slide here. Let me actually use the clicker. Um, so I started uh, uh, working in bioinformatics in 1997 and that was the state of the art um, at the time. Um, so I remember quite distinctly you know having access to what at the time was an amazingly powerful computer, Digital Alpha uh, 700 megahertz that cost about $10,000 and it could analyze about 10 sequences with uh, uh, sophisticated evolutionary models. Uh, that wasn't too much of a problem in 1997 because data generation was also slow. So the next panel here is, you know, that the state-of-the-art DNA sequencer was something like ABI PRISM, which could generate one um, DNA sequence of about 550 base pair in length. <coughs> and a large uh, sequence alignment at the time would you know, contains something like 500, 500, 500 sequences, and that was the um, chloroplast uh, alignment from plants that people were used to, you know, do large-scale analyses. GenBank, uh, which is the repository of all uh, publicly available genetic sequence data at the time, had 2 million sequences. And the term bioinformatics didn't really exist, um, and neither did Wikipedia, so you couldn't even look it up. Um, Python was in version 1, and I started developing, so didn't, people didn't even use that, people used Perl. Um, Hopefully, many of you don't know what that is. That, that would constitute a sign of progress. Um, and then I was using um, Mac OS 7. Um, all right, so from, yeah, giggles from people that were, that are older than that, remember, suffered with Perl. So in 2018, um, so, you know, your iPhone or um, uh, another uh, mobile device is going to have about 100 to 200 times more computing power than the state-of-the-art workstation. So, you know, A10 quad core 2.4 gigahertz. So it was actually really difficult to find how much faster they are because CPU comparisons only go back to about 10 years. So, you know, I challenged somebody to find a comparison between these computers. I couldn't do it. So that extrapolated it. Um, so um, I would say that actually, despite massive advances in computing power, they, they fall far behind our ability to generate sequence data. So now you can take one of these instruments here, Lumina High Seek system, which will generate 100 million of reads in one run. Um, so people now build trees with thousands to millions of sequences, and GenBank now has about a billion sequences, and it's actually now starting to accumulate genome data. Uh, so now there's bioeverything, it's mobile distributed cloud computing abstractions for the OS. Bioinformatics is a very mature field, and again, uh, I, I um, claim this because um, Wikipedia has settled on a consistent definition. It converged on what bioinformatics means. I've been teaching a bioinformatics course now for about 10 years, and every year I update, you know, my first slide in the first lecture is the Wikipedia definition of bioinformatics, and it's sort of, you know, kind of bounced around 2010, 2011. The last three years, it hasn't changed. So I just, you know, the community has now decided what bioinformatics means. Um, I still don't know what it really means, but you can, you can go and read it. It's just, you know, using computers to do something with biological data. 
<clears throat> but I'll actually, you know, I'll, I'll preface my talk by um, going back to um, people that worked before the age of big data. And um, if you're doing statistical modeling in general, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, philosophies to how to do this. And I've been influenced by uh, this British statistician, George Box, who's mostly known for things like, you know, model selection, apocryphal sayings. So I'll actually tell you what he stated, um, you know, now close to, I guess, 40 years ago. Uh, so the need for robust methods seems to be intimately mixed up with the need for simple methods, simple models. So simple is good. Uh, we make tentative assumptions about the real world, which we know are false, but which we believe may be useful nonetheless. Uh, since all models are wrong, the scientists cannot obtain a, quote, correct one by excessive elaboration. On the contrary, following William of Ockham, he should seek an economical description of natural phenomena. And then since all models are wrong, the scientists must be alert to what is importantly wrong. It is inappropriate to be concerned with mice when they are tigers abroad. All right, so in other words, simple is good, and don't, don't make things more complex than they have to be. Uh, and this, this is a, what I would consider prophetic wisdom from the 1970s that I think we should... There's a lot of bioinformatics that I'm not going to discuss at all that's actually concerned with going too far in the opposite direction. I think, you know, making things that are too complicated just because you can potentially fit them. Um, so putting in the context of what I work on, um, so you have larger and richer data sets, which means that you can fit more complex and biologically realistic models to them. Um, such models, um, you know, for instance, um, and I'll discuss all of these things in sufficient detail for, for you that don't work in this to kind of have an idea what they are. So models that work in coding sequence data, the ones that are parameter rich, you know, statistical mixture models are harder to fit in the context of phylogenetic likelihood. Since Alexis works here, I would imagine you've heard about phylogenetic likelihood at some point. It's just, uh, it's a foundational uh, um, uh, tool for um, doing comparative sequence analysis. Uh, so, operationally speaking, and a lot of my talk is basically very practical. How do we run things in realistic uh, time? Uh, so, if you have more complex models that are more expensive to fit, um, and the unit of um, um, expense here is one likelihood calculation, so that's a foundational operation you need to be able to do it. It's like matrix factorization, except, you know, and in, in slightly more involved process. And it can be um, accelerated with software hardware tweaks, but only up to a limit. Um, so you, can, uh, you also need to do more likelihood calculations for a data set uh, uh, of fixed size if you have complicated, more complicated model because you will have slower convergence, you'll have to run your MCMC chains longer, you have to do more iterations to find the maximum using gradient descent or whatever, model parameters, and you also have cursive dimensionality, which means it's really hard to fit, find the correct um, estimate. Uh, so it can be reduced by model tuning al algorithmic improvements, and this is what I'm going to focus on in the talk. Uh, so the goal is to allow... Um, Rapid model fitting um, with um, something that will also explain sensible site-to-site -site or branch site rate variation patterns for more than the typical upper bound or a few hundred sequences. All right, so now I'll give you a little bit of biological background. It's all very, very simple. Um, so there are um, um, a variety of processes that introduce variation to genomes of living organisms. So mutation, recombination, and other processes will introduce this variation. Um, the fitness of an organism, so you have variation and you have fitness which is determined by this variation. It describes how well an organism can survive, grow, function, or just generally reproduce. Um, and in the context, um, when you look at a specific mutation, a specific gene or a genome, um, a sensible way to look at it in the context of fitness. So does it do nothing to fitness? So any particular mutation that has very little effect in fitness is neutral, and the prevailing thought in uh, modern uh, biological synthesis is you know, neutral or nearly neutral theory. So uh, most mutations that you see um, have no um, or little uh, fitness. Then you have deleterious mutations which reduce fitness and you have adaptive mutations which increase fitness. An important context is that the same mutation can have different fitness costs in different environments. So this will, uh, 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 you, you can easily imagine it, you know, uh, uh, for drug resistance bacteria it makes sense to select for drug resistance if you apply the pressure of a drug, if you remove the drug, it's no longer, no longer makes sense to have this mutation. And the same mutation can also have different costs in different genetic backgrounds. So sometimes mutations can interact. Um, so a cartoon from Wikipedia, which I find useful, is that if, if you're thinking of drug resistance, which is probably the most common case that everybody will be familiar with, is that you have some population of bacteria here um, that um, you know, different colors mean uh, different mutation, uh, different uh, genetic uh, composition, so they, they have different mutations. <clears throat> then you apply uh, drug selective pressure, so this is resistance level. You know, if there's no drug selection, you know, they might all coexist, or even the red ones might disappear. But if you apply drug resistance pressure, these are now able to reproduce. 
and quickly outgrow everything else. So within a very short period of time, uh, you will have a drug resistance bacterial population. Um, to give you a, a less cartoonish example, so I've spent a lot of time working in viruses, specifically HIV. Um, <clears throat> so there's an example, and this, this is not uh, restricted to HIV. So, uh, you know, we have um, three uh, different major types of immunity, so we'll talk about one of them. So this is cell-based immunity. All it does, it identifies cells that make foreign proteins and kills them. So in the way this works, it's called CTL, or cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, uh, immune response. So if your cell is infected uh, with a foreign protein, for example, it has a virus that's making its own proteins, uh, there's a whole um, very complex cellular machinery that will take these proteins, chop them into small pieces, load them into special molecules, and transport them to the cell surface. Well, they'll actually stack out and present it to other cells that do immune surveillance. And if these cells bind to a foreign peptide, then another cascade is activated uh, whereby this cell is killed. The important uh, purpose, uh, the important point to understand for this immunity is that what we're looking at is a linear peptide. So you look at a genetic sequence and you look at a consecutive collection of amino acid letters. So, you know, nine to ten amino acids long. Uh, to see how quickly this operates, there was a beautiful um, experimental evolution study. So you might have heard um, things like measurably evolving populations, which means you can watch evolution take place, and HIV is one of these populations. Uh, so this was a paper from 2002. Um, it's uh, cited there at the bottom. And this was a study of SIV, so simian immune deficiency virus, which is the only animal model of HIV. And it's kind of a beautifully done study. Uh, so um, there were several uh, macaques in the study. Um, the researchers uh, profiled their immune system, so they identified which specific viral peptides would be targeted by that specific macaque. And it's actually different between macaques and different between people. Um, a lot of this goes back to um, the original work in the 60s about transplants when people were actually trying to find <coughs> match donors. So it's the same machinery that rejects transplants that also kills uh, uh, um, infected cells. So what they did then is they picked a virus, uh, infected a macaque with that virus, and the virus was guaranteed to have an epitope or a part of the genome that would be targeted by the immune system. Then they waited for two weeks to see what would happen to the virus, and then they sequenced, um, this was before deep sequencing, so they did what's called cloning, so they identified, uh, you know, they sequenced nine viruses from this macaque, and 10 viruses from this macaque, and this yellow box is um, the part that was targeted by the immune system. So this is two weeks. We're talking about something like 10 viral generations. And you can see that within these 10 weeks, there is already rampant variation in the part that's targeted by the immune system. Right? So the virus is rapidly developing mutations that make uh, it unrecognizable to the immune system. This is probably the cleanest case of positive selection because you know the virus wants to survive, the immune system wants to kill it. In order for the virus to escape the immune system, it needs to change what the immune system recognizes, and it does it. Now, the important part is that this, um, when you see this, this is now a combined effect of um, mutation and selection. So one can think that because there's uh, variation here, this is where mutation happens. No, mutations happens, mutations happens randomly across the entire genome, very, very rapidly. And so there were, um, there were mutations that occurred everywhere else, but you don't see them because they were removed by selection. They were not adaptive, so they were actually irrelevant. But these uh, conferred increased fitness to the virus, so it grew up very quickly. Um, so you have key drivers in adaptation, so things like zoonoses and transmissions to new hosts. So when you talk about, you know, when you read about Ebola and things like that, people are concerned about um, adaptive changes to the new host for infectivity or pathogenicity, uh, immune selection, development of drug resistance, uh, virulence and transmissibility. Um, host and pathogen arms races, but most of the time, most of the viral genome is conserved. So, um, in fact, as you might see, even in that previous slide, there's nothing going on except for the part uh, that is targeted by the immune system. So, I'll give you a little bit of a very, very, again, basic background of what models will look at. So, you have uh, uh, genes are encoded by DNA, coding DNA sequences. Uh, these are trans transcribed into RNA. Um, so you have, and this is a one-to-one -one map. So you have four letters in DNA, four letters in RNA. So this is a one-to-one -one map. Then RNA is transcribed and assembled, and then you have um, a map from 61 codons, so triplets of letters. So four times four times four gives you 64 letters. Three of them have special meaning, which means stop translation. So 61 are the ones that are used to encode amino acids, and there's redundancy here. So you have 61 codons mapping down to 20 amino acids, and this now makes a protein. Protein is what makes function. So a proper unit of evolution when you're looking at selection is a codon. Mutation happens at the DNA level. Selection happens by and large at the protein level, so you need to account for both of these things. 
And you have two different types of, of, of mutations. So you can have mutations here that because of the redundancy of the genetic code, which maps uh, codons to amino acids, do not actually change the amino acid. So these are called synonymous. And you have non-synonymous, which change the amino acid. Presumably, if you don't change the amino acid, you get exactly the same molecule on the other end, so it does the same thing. Um, to give you an example, um, using actual sequence data, so here's, um, here's an alignment of three viruses. You might have heard of one of them, measles. Uh, Renderpest is its um, um, ancestor. It was found in large cattle, and it's recently been declared eradicated. Uh, and pest de petite, um, which is a, a, a petite ruminant, so it's, it's a pest that affects small ruminants, so things like goats. Um, so here's an alignment of, amino of nucleotide sequences, and all you really want to see here is there's a lot of variation. You can even see the blocks. So this is measles, the second block is render pest, and the third block are three. So these are three different viral species. They look quite different in the nucleotide level. However, if you look at the amino acids, they're all exactly the same which means that through all these thousands of years of evolution between these two viruses, DNA sequences changed, but amino acids remain the same. So this is, in effect, a very, very strong selection. The only mutations that you see fixed are synonymous mutations. If you look on the flip side, which is um, uh, um, influenza virus, and I'm sure we've all had, everybody in this room had at least one influenza infection, so your immune system has seen it and done something to modify the virus. Here you have the opposite picture, where there's a little fragment of an antigen binding site in influenza A virus where nucleotide variation is mapped to amino acid variation. So almost every mutation that you see here is non-synonymous. So now that's being promoted because the virus is adapting to the immune system. So with this intuition in mind, basically this is a signature of selection and this is a signature of conservation. So you can formalize it by saying that because synonymous substitutions do not change the protein, we will assume that they have no effect in fitness. Um, you can estimate the rate at which these mutations accumulate, and this is called DS, and this is, gives you sort of the background evolutionary speed. And then you can compare the rate of accumulation of non-synonymous mutations or substitutions which alter the protein sequence to this background rate to classify the nature of the evolutionary process. So you estimate these two ratios, and this is actually, I mean, this is obviously a cartoon. You have to use more complicated methods to do it. So if you take the number of synonymous mutations normalized by how many you expect to find if there's no selection, and then if you take the number of non-synonymous substitutions and normalize it by how many you expect to find, if, again, if there's no selection, it gives you these two DS and DN. So basically, it's the you know, rate of synonymous uh, evolution and rate of non-synonymous evolution. You take the ratio of the two here, and you end up with um, these three possible um, arrangements. So if synonymous mutations um, or substitutions accumulate faster than synonymous, you assume that selection is promoting diversity. So you have positive selection operating. So you expect this, like in the influenza antigenic site. Negative selection is where um, um, non-synonymous mutations are actually being removed by selection because you expect this to be uh, the sort of the normal state of a biological system. It doesn't need to change everything. Most of it is already working well. A neutral evolution where they're not distinguishable. All right, so that's all the background. I'm going to tell you some more about the, uh, the actual uh, statistical models that we use. Um, I'll, well, actually, no, I'll give you one more example. So codon, codon substitution models, which estimate this DS and DM, were originally proposed in 1994 uh, and are commonly used um, in testing for evidence of positive selection. So uh, they provide you a, norm, a statistical framework where you can estimate synonymous and non-synonymous substitution rates from the data, and the ratio is a useful measure of selective pressure. So this was um, 1994, and this was absolutely the state of the art. You, could, you were pushing the computing power of the time to do, as I said, 10 sequences with these models. And then four years later, um, this model unfortunately had a very, very bad, biologic, biologically very bad assumption, which I'll illustrate in the next slide, uh, which was relaxed four years later by Nielsen and Yang, is that one, um, the, the D and DS have to actually change depending on where in the protein you look. So it has to be done in a tractable way because natural selection is variable across sequence and time. So I'll give you a cartoon, and this is data from... Um, uh, within host evolution of HIV-1. So this is something, a study that we did in the context of trying to understand how um, HIV es escapes immune selective pressure. So I'll walk you through the slides so you kind of have an idea of what's going on. Uh, so this is a tree of viral sequences isolated from one individual over, I believe, three years. Uh, colors are time, so these are the oldest sequences, and as you progress down the tree, you get into more and more recent sequences. Uh, and this is the divergence scale. So here you have 5%. Uh, so 005, which means on average, this blue sequence uh, differs from this sequence at 5% of nucleotide positions. 
does anybody know, um, you know, what is the closest mammalian species that's 5% different from us? Hmm? No, dolphins more, but I mean, probably something like a gibbon, right? So this is, keep that as, in mind as your evolutionary framework. Now, this is what HIV does within one patient within three years, right? The same amount of genetic divergence as between us and gibbons. All right, so that's quite impressive. Um, and you can watch it, um, so there's one way to view, so this is the time scale of how it quickly it diverges over time. So these lines are basically the distance from the infecting strain, and these circles indicate how, how variable it is at a given time point. So as you see here, initially all the sequences um, are identical, and as you go through time, at a specific time point, they become more and more different. So if you take two sequences from a later time point, that, that will normally be different from what infected the patient, but they'll also be different from one another. To see how much variation happens across time within one patient, here's another slide, uh, which is busy, but it contains, I think, all the useful information. So what's shown on the axis is a position, an amino acid within this envelope protein that's under strong selective pressure. So about 880 amino acid positions here. So what's shown on the y-axis is time, except this is, a, this is all the times combined, so don't look at the top part, just look at below the blue line. So this, these are all the sequences in 2008, March, May 2009, all the way to October 2011. And what's shown on these little blips indicate the estimated DS and DN, so how variable is a particular site, and these little circles indicate that a particular site has been inferred to be under selection. So you can see initially the virus is basically not doing anything. It's very uniform. There's not a whole lot of selective pressure. Then the immune system realizes it's there, starts to apply selective pressure, and some of the sites in the genome light up, so they start changing. And as you go through time, more and more of them change. So these little circles are the sites that are responding to immune selective pressure, and we're able to look at this just by sequence variation. And this is what happens if you combine all the data, so if you do all the joint analysis. So the point of the story is that selection changes both across time because not the same sites are under selection at different time points, and across the gene, because not all the sites are under the same selection or not. So this is an important um, uh, uh, modeling uh, framework that we need to keep in mind. All right, I, I, I would also encourage you, if you have, if anything's unclear, and if you, want quest, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me, and I'll also have a question um, and answer session at the end. Um, so um, now we'll go back to the computer science aspect of this. Uh, and um, tell you, you know, how does this translate to the actual statistical model and computation, and what do I have to worry about to estimate all of this? Um, so this brings me back to the idea of phylogenetic likelihood, which is a foundational step of, uh, I would say, most modern um, algorithms for secondary, like you want to build a tree, or tertiary, like you have a tree, but you want to infer uh, the patterns of selection analysis. So this likelihood function, which I'll denote as L, um, uh, is the likelihood of a single alignment site an alignment site, if you go back to my previous slide, so here, this here, um, all the nucleotides in a particular column or a codon in a particular column is an alignment site, so this is the unit of data. Um, so we have, um, it's, a, it's a parametric function, you have to put a lot of things in to compute it, you have to give it a phylogenetic tree, uh, an example of such a tree was um, uh, shown for the within-host viral evolution. You have to give it um, an evolutionary model, which says how, how nucleotides or codons change over time, and you have to give the parameters that describe this model. Uh, typically, um, in not special cases, this, um, the, c the cost of computing this uh, function for a single set of parameter values using what's called the canonical Felsenstein's dynamic programming or pruning algorithm is linear in the size of the tree, and quadratic to cubic in the size of the alphabet, even though it doesn't have to be. So uh, Alexis and others have figured out that it can actually be subquadratic. Um, but because of this, going from nucleotides to codons boots the complexity by two to three orders of magnitude. So just because you want to look at coding sequence data, you're already paying a significant computational cost because the size of the alphabet is um, now 61, 61 codons, and for traditional DNA data, it's four, right? So, you know, increase it by a factor of 15, so your computational complexity goes up by either 15 squared or 15 cubed or somewhere in between. Uh, there's, all, there's definitely a cube operation there because you have to um, uh, factorize, you have to uh, compute eigenvalues of a matrix or you have to, uh, of that dimension, or you have to compute its exponential, which is inherently cubic. Uh, now, um, the other, um, so this is um, the likelihood function, and then um, how do we um, model this unobserved uh, rate variation across time? So rate, substitution rate is at which 
um, which um, rate um, substitutions fix a particular uh, part in the gene or a particular point in time. Um, so we, we want to pick this favorite unobserved rate parameter, say DS or DN, and assume it depends on the position of the alignment, um, which it does based on the empirical data they showed you. It's all over the place. It changes through time and space. Um, we want to estimate, um, so some of the questions that people ask is, estimate the value of the rate parameter to given position in the gene. All right, let's just get a point um, or a confidence interval. Uh, biologically more relevant, it's actually really difficult to do. So this is, you might as well give up on this. Uh, it's very imprecise. It's difficult to estimate this rate precisely for a single site, uh, unless you have a lot of data, which run into other problems. So what typically people ask is, compute some posterior probability or p-value that this rate lies in a particular predefined set. So is the ratio of dn and ds different from 1? So this is now a statistical hypothesis test, and you estimate a parameter value, and you say, does it belong to a predefined set or not? Or estimate the distribution of rate parameter and inspect its properties. Um, so um, common frameworks for handling rate variation, and again, I'd like to emphasize that this is actually very standard statistics that goes back to at least 1940s, 1950s, random effects, uh, where you say um, um, that uh, there's a small number of rates, and a useful proxy to think for rates is the site is fast or slow. Fast, slow, intermediate. So it's a categorical classification. Um, and um, the number of categorical classifications you allow a particular site in alignment to uh, fault through is much smaller than the number of sites. So in, in a lot of practical applications, there'll be four, right? Three or four, Des despite the fact that your typical protein is going to have hundreds of alignments. So you marginalize over the distribution of K-rate classes and estimate distribution hyperparameters. So, um, and again, um, uh, this is something that, um, you know, a, 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 as I get older in this field, I kind of get um, um, more interested in why people pick specific ad hoc approximations, right? So there was, uh, uh, if, you, if you go and look at a paper that will use this framework to say estimate a phylogenetic tree, um, a lot of them will just pick four rate classes, right? Why? Because everybody else has picked four rate classes up to this point. So you can cite a lot of literature and you don't actually investigate sensitivity or specificity. And in most cases it works just fine because, you know, it's not a sense, your model is not sensitive to this. But, and several more systematic approaches have been tried but never really caught on because it's much easier to just pick four than to think about, you know, which number you need to pick. Uh, you can also do a different approach, which is called fixed effects in statistics, which you estimate rates directly at each site. So we have a paper, and other people have lots of papers in this, which I'm not going to talk about. All right. Not, not, not all parameters in the data um, are equal. So um, you have um, the likelihood depends on a structure parameter, which is a tree topology, M, which is a model. So this is where we put all of our biological knowledge about things happen. And then you have theta, which encodes this model, and it can have very heterogeneous parameters. So how long is a particular branch in the phylogenetic tree? How quickly does a particular type of substitution happen? If you have this random effects model, you need to have a mixture proportion and some other hyperparameters, and then you have character frequency. So they're all different. They mean different things. Some of them are structured. Some of them are just continuous. Some of them are vectors. Some of them are scalars. But their meaning and their importance also really changes in the type of, of application. If you're a systematist that wants to know how a species evolved or where a particular you know, a uh, 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 phenotype like flightless birds, how, how they related to all the other birds, where did birds acquire wings, then all you really care about is inferring this tree, right? Because that tree tells you everything you need to know, and everything else is a nuisance parameter. You have to put it in to compute the likelihood, but you don't actually care about it. So you want to be a fully Bayesian about it if you can, which is I'm just going to integrate everything out and identify the tree or a set of trees that I care about. Um, what I care about is the substitution rate. So now everything else becomes a nuisance. So when I give this talk to evolutionary biologists and I tell them the tree is a nuisance, they get annoyed because a lot of them worry about the tree as a primary factor. But in this case, I have to put in the tree to do the calculation. I don't actually care about this, but I care about this. I care about the evolutionary rate. Um, so depending on what you care about, you will emphasize or de-emphasize various parts of the inference process. Uh, and, you know, since it's an institute of theoretical studies, I figured I'd put some formulas up. They're actually not that important. Um, but um, this kind of gives you um, uh, the progression of um, a specific class of phylogenetic models through time. Uh, so what I'm trying to do, you have an alignment on S sites, so your gene has S codons, and this will typically be in the hundreds. Um, and what I want to do is I want to compare three types of models and how much they cost to compute uh, for uh, likelihood for common codon models. So this one is the first one, constant rates. Um, so, um, you know, for those of you statistically minded, you, um, you assume that all the sites evolve independently, compute the likelihood of generating a particular site into this model, 
and you take a product over all sites. This is the independent assumption. So this is the cost of relative cost and likelihood evaluations is S, the number of sites. Then the 1998, the marginalization of our site comes in here. So you know, this likelihood is now depends on the rate at a site, which comes from some probability, and you integrate it out by summing over rates. So it's discrete distribution with k rates. You now have to do this calculation k times, so you now have your com computation now becomes k times more expensive. What we figured out how to do is 2011, you can actually move this sum from outside to inside and do this sum once for models. You actually get a much better, likely, much better statistical model, and you bring it back to s. Um, so you actually don't have to do this extra calculation. And the other thing that I would like to tell you is that these, uh, when you compute the likelihood function, depending on which parameter you change, you incur different computational costs. So if you have a local model parameter, such as a branch length, so if you change this blue model, if you do something that only affects this blue branch, but the structure of the process, you, all you need to do is um, do the calculation that involves these three branches, and the rest of the tree you can just ignore. So this is effectively a local calculation that doesn't depend on how big this tree is. But if you change um, a parameter that modifies all the branches in the tree, um, you know, affects some, all the models in the tree, you have to do a much more complicated calculation. And um, the models that we're interested in, like uh, rate inference, they all do this. So it's inherently not a cheap calculational problem. All right. So now I will present in the remaining 20-odd you know, minutes, I'll present two methods that we've developed and published. Um, and they all go back to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, um, uh, recommendations from Box, the statistician that I mentioned on, on the third slide. Um, um, basically, let's do as simple as possible, not estimate what we don't need to estimate, and worry about important things. So the first one is, um, and, and, and these have tie-ins to statistical learning. Um, which you might find interesting. Um, so this, the first one is adaptive complexity models. So uh, the, pre the premise that I have here is we wish to seek an economical description of natural phenomena. So first is what, the question, what is the question that we're interested in? So we have a coding alignment. So we have a gene that was sampled from different species. And we wish to test for evidence of episodic diversifying positive selection. So we look at a tree, at all the branches in the tree, and ask, is there evidence that a proportion of sites uh, that gene evolved with um, DND is greater than one. So biologically speaking, this is a statistical way to say, is this branch under positive selection? That's, um, and if you look at a specific branch, it means you, you focus at a specific point in time. Um, and you're also asking it to not apply to every, every site in the gene, but just a, um, a, a, a subset of sites in the gene, which is how selection operates. Uh, so the basic framework for this is uh, um, you know, what's called unrestricted branch site model. Um, so, um, we wish to estimate these unobserved rate parameters. Statistical framework to think about it is that uh, at a specific site at a particular branch, the rate is a draw from a branch-specific discrete distribution with a fixed number of rates that depends on the branch. I'll give you examples to contextualize all of this. Uh, then once we've decided, um, you know, once we've fitted these omegas, then we can decide uh, whether or not uh, a proportion is significantly greater than one using a likelihood ratio test. And the very simple idea that surprisingly is the first, we were the first ones to actually do it, is that the complexity of the model should actually not be the same across all the evolutionary branches. Right? Seems sensible, right? A priori, there's a reason to believe that things evolve exactly the same way through time. Um, so here's a specific application. There was a Nature paper that used our method. Uh, so coelacanth, um, that was a, the, they, they sequenced the coelacanth, which is kind of an interesting um, outgroup species. And um, they used our method to ask questions like this. So there's a phylogeny of um, some species that you might recognize. So there's some fish, there's coelacanth, there are more fish, there are mammals here, and birds. Uh, and this is just um, uh, the evolution of one specific gene. Um, and they used our method to say that um, the uh, lineage leading to tetrapods and amniotes had evidence of positive selection of that specific gene. And then you can go and interpret this, that this gene had an important function in the evolution of tetrapods. So some function was acquired by all these species and it could presumably be traced to an adaptive change in this specific gene. So again, you know, evolution, when the new species emerges, they have to somehow be different from previous species, which means they have to do something the previous species couldn't do, they'll look different or eat different, or you know, be a different size, and you, the, presumably you can trace this back to a change in a small subset of genes that um, uh, encode that particular functionality. So that's a specific application of our tools uh, um, by other people. So it doesn't even, and it has to do nothing to do with viruses. Right, so not everything. Um, I work with viruses, but that doesn't mean that our tools are not applied to viruses. Uh, all right, so intuition. 
where does the signal for model complexity comes from? In fact, our original implementation also just used three branch classes, just because it's convenient, it was kind of convention. So each branch has three different rate classes that you could pull um, uh, rates from. Now, if you've ever done any mixture modeling, if you try to fix mi mi a mixture of Gaussians or do some sort of a clustering problem, uh, mixture models are great uh, unless they're too complicated because then you have too many parameters to estimate and they have very poor convergence properties or they will just collapse mixture distributions into simple ones. And the very, very basic idea uh, that we had um, is that if you have a very short branch in a tree, short branch, the length of a branch is sort of the amount of evolution that happened. A very short branch means not a whole lot of stuff happened. It was a very, either a short period of time or a very slow evolutionary rate. So if not a whole lot of things happened, why do we need to worry about modeling it with a complex model? So the basic idea is that perhaps shorter branches don't need any complexity. Um, and it actually is borne out by the data. So um, here's a cartoon of what this model does. Here's an evolutionary tree on 10 species. This is of some immune gene. And I'm focusing on this, um, on the CAD branch here. So it's a long branch. Uh, it's, um, you know, this is the scale in expected substitutions per site. So this, this is actually a very diverse protein. You expect about one in every two and a half nucleotides to change along this branch. It's a lot, right? Again, this is now 40% divergence. Right? This is basically like between us and bacteria. Um, so with this specific protein, fast evolving, CAT, to its most recent common ancestor, accumulate a lot of changes. So what our, um, what our model did is partition this into three rate classes, which says that uh, along the lineage going to CAT, this specific protein had 49% of the gene evolving under, under purifying selection, so omega 2.27. 8.7% evolved with um, omega 1, so strictly neutral, and 43% evolved with positive selection, so omega greater than 1. And there's a p-value that says that, this, yes, this is significant. Um, all right, so this is a branch with something's happening. It's long, and there's a lot of selective complexity, so we should fit a model to it that, that fits, that, that captures this. It's not necessary, though, that a long branch has three ray classes. For instance, this one, if you fit three ray classes to it and let the model do what you want, you see that two of them collapse to the same value. So you parameterize the model with too many ray parameters. It doesn't need one of them. It actually doesn't use it. So you can capture this with two ray classes. And if you look at a single, um, at a very short branch here, Teresa's monkey, which has a length of 0 0.003, um, then uh, there's nothing going on here. So you still give it three ray classes, but the model actually puts everything into a single ray class and says these have no support. So if you think about it, if you don't allow, if you always just fit three ray classes to each model, it's unnecessary because some of them don't need it, and it turns out to be very computationally expensive and wasteful. So here's how our, our model proceeds. And this is, um, uh, uh, if, you do, if you've done forward variable selection um, in statistics or something like this, uh, it, it's a very, it should be a very familiar process where you, um, you, you fix all the parameters you don't care about. So you fix the tree, estimate and fix some of the nuisance model parameters um, that are shared by all branches using simpler models. So you do what's called a plug-in estimate with a simpler model. You just reduce the complexity model wildly and only care on the parameters that you want about. Uh, you're interested in. You fit a simple baseline model, so you say uh, there's only one rate class per branch. Use this model to get initial guesses for all the other parameters. And then you use a greedy step-up procedure like forward variable selection. So for each branch, you start with the longest. You say, if I add another rate parameter, do I get a better fit to the model using something like AIC, which is a way to compare models. And then you keep doing this until you no longer obtain uh, improvement. Uh, and then once you've done this, you have um, a model that's now adapted um, to every branch, and then you can perform selection testing on this branch. So what does this actually give you? It gives you two interesting things. First, it gives you incredible uh, performance gains. So here's an example uh, comparing um, two models that basically do the same thing in different size of data sets. So CD2 was this um, toy example uh, from the previous tree. So it has 10 sequences and 187 codons. ABSREL is our implementation, and this is the fastest uh, implementation that uses sort of a fixed complexity, slightly different model. Uh, that we could find um, at the time. So um, our implementation on small data set gives you two-fold time performance, uh, two-fold speed up. Um, if you look at a longer gene, um, BRCA1, you might know this, this is a breast cancer gene, so this is a comparison between different species. Now you have a seven and a half times um, improvement. And as you go down the slide, even if you look at something that doesn't seem that big, so an influenza alignment with 267 sequences and 419 codons, um, we extrapolated that with this method to do the test would take a year and a half. 
uh, and we could do it in six and a half hours. And you have a three order of magnitude speed up. And the key here is that this method actually does a better job at single likelihood calculations than we do, but we do a lot fewer of them because we've actually significantly removed, we've um, significantly dropped the complexity of the models. All right, we get, um, um, uh, so we can actually, and you can see that this is a significant difference. This is basically analysis that you can't run. If you have something that takes a year and a half to run, um, unless, you know, uh, uh, that's your entire job and you're trying to large, do a lar very large scale simulation and one outcome is enough, this is, this is not usable. A biologist cannot use it. Right? If you're a postdoc, you wait half of your postdoc for this to finish and then you hope it gives you a result that you can publish. And you can't do any simulations or anything else. So this is a significant uh, um, improvement. And the other interesting thing is that we came up, uh, uh, we can actually just do a large scale exploration of how complicated is the evolutionary process. So how often across different um, um, proteins and different species do you see interesting uh, um, or complex evolutionary uh, uh, regimes occur? Uh, so um, fortunately for us, they're very diligent people that maintain excellent curated databases of um, um, things that we could use for benchmarking. So this particular one is from a Swiss group called Selectome. Um, so it's not the name of the group, it's the name of the database, the group, uh, the reference is given here. So we took their 9,000 mammalian gene alignments uh, from, um, uh, uh, their, so this is not the entire tree of life, but this is something like 60 different mammalian species. And then we just ran our method on them, right? For one thing, because it's so fast, you can actually do this entire analysis in a small cluster in about half a day. Um, so you can, lar you can um, and as we discovered, uh, based on this screen, most of the time, nothing happens. So across a large domain of life, across the entire genome or half of their genome, the large majority of branches do absolutely nothing. So there's nothing interesting going on, which is actually encouraging, right? Remember, go back to something that I said, most of the time evolution just keeps things in place. Um, but occasionally, uh, um, the few, so there's one in about 3,700 3, branches that have three ray classes. So these are the interesting branches where there's a lot of adaptation happening and we need to focus on these branches. Um, in fact, if you do not allow these models to have sufficiently complex branches, you miss all of the signal. You say there's nothing going on. So in other words, by and large, you can ignore um, most of the branches. They don't do anything interesting. You need to find the ones where interesting things happen and focus on them. And our model gives you an automated way to do this. In fact, we found, uh, so this is a justification for picking three. Um, we didn't restrict things to stop at three, but there was not a single branch in this data set that required four A classes. So three seems to be sort of an informational upper bound on how much information you can extract from a single branch in the phylogenetic tree in a single tree, in a single gene. And you can also ask, uh, so here's, um, this is sort of a sensitivity analysis of what happens. Uh, so what's shown here is um, y-axis shows you what proportion of branches want to have something uh, other than a very simple evolutionary model. So which one of them need more than one ray class? Uh, and these are covariates, right? So here um, are, as you get longer genes, uh, so for very long genes, about 40% of the branches require uh, more than one ray class. For very short genes, it's about 10%, and this is a nice uh, upward trend. And this, this, uh, this, this was encouraging because this was originally intuition. If you have long branches, they need this additional model complexity. And so this is a branch that has length zero. This is a branch of length two. Um, and if you think about it, a branch of length two is kind of crazy. It means that every site changed at least twice on average. So this, you've mutated every position in that sequence at least twice. Um, on average. So it's completely saturated, as you might imagine. If you start with a word and you mutate every letter twice, um, you, you expect to find no resemblance to the original word. But you can still... You can, yeah. um, so you, you have this nice, um, very rapid increase in how many branches need to have more than one rate class as you make them longer. Oh, we can ignore the other two. And the other interesting thing that we came out of this is that there are, um, you know, um, if you don't um, model um, the necessary evolutionary process, you end up with very silly inferences. So this is the cost of model misspecification. <clears throat> and um, um, this was um, a paper that used this was actually the only paper that was ever on that got a lot of significant press coverage. And I can tell you about that later if you're interested, but it was amusing. Because the only reason we got significant press coverage is because we looked at herpes, the virus, and people got really excited about that because, you know, herpes. Um, it wasn't even the herpes that you think about. Um, so models that fail to account for significant shifts in selective pressure uh, through lineages will significantly underestimate branch lengths. Um, 
And if you've ever um, looked at um, a modern paper that studies how a vi virus came to be, the people do something called molecular dating, which is to try to estimate how long ago a particular pathogen became introduced into the human population. And you have typically have very shallow sampling, so you, you only have data from the last 30 to 50 years because we've only known how to sequence things for 30 to 50 years. Um, so if you're looking at, you know, for instance, how old measles is, you can't go back 400 years and find a measles virus because there's just no samples. Um, so um, because you have this very shallow sampling, uh, it creates a situa situation where terminal branches in the tree have very high, relatively high ome uh, omega, and deep branches have very low omega. So an example of this can, can, shown, can be shown here. Uh, so here's a tree of, of measles, render pest, and pest petite ruminant virus. So all the red isolates are measles, and these are all recent. And we want to date how long this branch is, because if we can tell how long ago this particular thing happened, it means this is when measles became introduced into the human population. And this is what happens if you, this is, this is all on the same scale. If th this is a model that doesn't account for selection, and this is a model that does. So all of a sudden you see that this uh, branch has a very, very different length, depending on which model you fit to it. Um, and we can, we can actually say that, um, and the reason we did this is because somebody published a paper using this model that said um, all the measles is 600 years old. All of measles. Sounds sensible if you don't know anything about it. But if you start digging, um, it actually becomes very clear very quickly that this is an anachronistic estimate. For example, uh, there, is, uh, there was a Persian physician named Razis who wrote a treatise about differential diagnosis of measles and smallpox, which is 1,500 years old. Right? So you have a historical record which flatly contradicts molecular dating. Right? And you, you will believe the historical record and say molecular dating is just wrong. It underestimates the age of measles by at least a factor of two and a half. And we can actually fix this by um, using a more realistic substitution model. And we actually did this you know, for coronavirus, Ebola, avian influenza, and herpes virus. There was, for instance, one paper that said all of influenza is 3,000 years old. It isn't. It's so old that we can't date how old it is. Um, all right, and now we'll conclude by talking about how we thought we were clever, but we just reinvented the wheel, which happens a lot. In, uh, um, but you know, at least it was a different, different um, application of the wheel. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, I'm also proud of this acronym. So we published a paper called FUBAR. Um, we got some pushback from the editors. Uh, but then I encourage you to actually do, if you're curious and you have a couple of hours to waste, um, you can do a Google Scholar search for various terms that are also you know, potentially uh, uh, not PG-13. Uh, and there's some interesting titles uh, uh, that are in, in, in the published literature. I can tell you um, when I'm not on microphone, because some of them are, are, are quite crude. Um, but um, yeah, so FUBAR is Fast Unrestricted Bayesian Approximation, a very logical acronym. So um, here's, um, and then this is a very simple idea, um, which is again, we want to uh, minimize the number of expensive calculations when we do this inference. So for random effects uh, framework, we want to estimate this posterior probability. So given data at a site, what is the probability that positive selection is occurring or omega is greater than one? Uh, in many applications, this is um, done using an empirical Bayes approach. Um, so, which is just that, this is the statement of an empirical Bayes approach. To estimate this posterior, which we can't, we can't calculate, we can calculate the probability of generating the data given a specific omega. We can um, draw this omega from some distribution. We can compute the posterior probability, and voila, we have what we want. So um, the key to realize is that the, the cost of computing these true probabilities is very, very different. So if you change omega here, you have to compute the phylogen phylogenetic likelihood, which is very expensive. Uh, if you change um, these hyperparameters here, this is very cheap. So there's a very asymmetric cost in doing these calculations. So our philosophy was, let's just not do this more often than we have to. In traditional framework, you do this, you basically do a standard fitting where you move these omegas all the time, and that becomes expensive. So here's um, a cartoon for how this is done. So we want to estimate this unobserved surface for synonymous rate and non-synonymous rate. This is just um, an idealized surface that we never get to observe that we want to estimate. The random effect models, um, so if you think about it, you, you want to build a tent of a specific shape. So you have canvas on the ground. And there are two different approaches to do this. The first approach is that I'm giving you a, a small number of poles, like nine, which is you know, what we have. But you're free to place them where you want and adjust their height. So this is what's going on here. Uh, the operation of moving a pole is very expensive. 
because moving a pole means you change the rate parameter and means you have to recompute expensive likelihood functions. Adjusting the height of the pole is very cheap because all you're doing is adjusting the probability of getting a, a specific rate. So this is all the standard thing. You basically, you move these poles around, and you adjust their heights, and you try to approximate this unobserved density as well as you can. This is what everybody has been doing. But we did something that seems counterintuitive. Um, let's actually give you 400 poles instead of nine, but fix their locations. And now you're welcome to adjust their heights. So I've taken away one degree of freedom, which is you're no longer free to move them, but you can adjust their height, and there are more of them. So this is this approximation where you have fixed poles, and you move them up and down. Um, and here, because you don't allow the poles to move around, uh, it becomes very cheap to adjust their heights. So I'll give you another intuition, which you might remember. Um, some people in this room will remember. Um, and it's, it's image processing, and it's very simple. So back in the day, you had to worry about how many bits you put in a pixel to represent a color. Um, you know, when web browsers were slow and you used modems. Um, I mean, people still do it, but not to that extent. So here's an image. This is an image of a monkey. This monkey, I took a picture in South Africa. This monkey actually tried to steal my lunch. It looks very cute unless you turn your head away and it tries to, you know, it jumps up and steals your sandwich. Um, and it has 20 friends that, that clamor if you try to chase it away. Um, little monkeys can be surprisingly intimidating. So um, um, to go back to my analogy, I can do two ways. I can approximate this image in two different ways. I can do what's called an adaptive palette, which means I pick five colors and I'm free to choose which colors I want to maximize how well this image is represented. As you can see, it doesn't do a particularly great job, right? I mean, you can still see the monkey, but the color, you know, there's no gradients, it's all washed out. Um, the other analogy is I have a fixed number of colors, and now each pixel has to go into one of these colors, and as you can see with these 216 colors which don't depend on the image, I do a much better job approximating the image. Um, and you also do it much faster because you don't have to do an adaptive optimization. So here's the FUBAR procedure. So we fix, again, all the nuisance parameters, fix tree topology, branch lengths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we decide where to place these tent poles, um, and um, we just do it at arbitrary 20 by 20 rates. Once we've decided where to place them, we still have to compute the likelihood function, but we only have to do it once for the entire duration of the process. And you fix the number of likelihood calculations beforehand. It doesn't depend on the size of the data anymore. You don't have to, because remember, if you do optimization, more data typically means more calculations. So we, with this procedure, we can a priori say, well, we'll do no more than 400 likelihood calculations. Everything else doesn't involve likelihood calculations. And then we can use, um, um, basically, Metropolis Hastings MCMC, which turns out we don't have to use, uh, with Dirichlet prior to allocate weights to each rate or adjust the height of the, uh, of the branches, uh, uh, of the poles. Um, and then we can infer um, whether or not a specific site is under selection. So here's a cartoon um, uh, of actual data. So this is, um, this is my grid. It's a log scale, so it's not uniformly spaced. It's not a uniform grid because we have some biological um, reasons to believe that we need to approximate parts of it better than others. Uh, this is the tent uh, shape that it inferred by adjusting the height of these points. And this is a site-level empirical inference where this is a site-level posterior where you take this as a prior allow the data to modify it, and then now all the weight moves. So this is um, on this plane here, the diagonal divides things into positive selection, which is here, and negative selection. So as you see, the prior kind of distributes things over the entire plane. But over this specific side, the data moves everything into positive selection, and everything here is moved in the negative selection. Um, and if you, large, um, if you have a large data set, um, then you have a much tighter estimate, so there's a lot less noise, and you have much tighter posteriors, but fundamentally it's all the same. Um, so FUBAR is really fast. Um, here's, um, you know, just to indicate to you is that we increase. So this is the best competitive method here, uh, there. Um, and this is the cost of com computation in um, time in seconds. So the number of codon sites is increased. So this isn't too bad, but this is the part where, um, where you really um, uh, um, uh, uh, benefit from it, which is the number of sequences that you put into the alignment. For example, we could analyze, you know, 3,000 sequences in about, you know, an hour and a half on 10 CPUs which is, you know, um, you couldn't do this analysis at all with other methods. All right, so I'll skip this. There's also, you know, if you don't, uh, this also gives you, all I'm going to say about this is like in the previous methods, by doing, so, uh, by, by doing this approximation, you actually get uh, better statistical properties. And then uh, um, we realize that if you do machine learning, um, everything that's worth doing has already been done by Michael Jordan, um, not the basketball player, but Michael I. Jordan. Um, uh, he's, um, uh, for those of you that don't know, he's a uh, 
um, machine learning expert at UC Berkeley. Um, so, and um, this exact framework in a much more general setting actually has been developed for um, document classification. So there's a set of methods that's actually been increasingly popular in a variety of applications called latent Dirichlet allocation, LDA, um, and it's actually exactly what we do and we didn't know this. Um, so here's um, your LDA as it was um, uh, uh, canonically uh, uh, stated. So um, you have a collection of texts and you want to classify them into um, topics. Um, so latent Dirichlet allocation is called a generative model, so you can produce, uh, you can compute the probability of generating a particular collection of words. You have two sets of hyperparameters called here alpha and beta. Um, and when you generate, because it's a generative model, you have to be able to generate um, um, a collection of words. So the way you do this is first you draw um, this um, Dirichlet parameter, uh, theta, Dirichlet distributed parameter theta, which has k dimensions. Uh, then for each word in a document, first you, you cho choose a topic from which this word came from, which is now multinomial in this distribution. So Dirichlet distribution gives you a nice way to draw uh, a collection of k numbers that add up to one. So this, um, once you've drawn this, you now have a multinomial distribution on k objects. Um, so, and then uh, once you have this topic, you draw a word, which itself is multinomially distributed and controlled by these parameters beta. Um, and if you stare at this long enough and some other things that are put together, you actually realize this is exactly the same uh, framework, uh, exactly the same expression as what we had for um, computing um, um, uh, the probability of generating a particular site with a particular rate combination in our data. So to FUBAR, uh, it's a general model for alignment sites. We actually fix alpha to be 0.5 and beta to be normalized conditional probabilities by different DNDS values. Theta is now dimension is the size of the grid, and for each alignment site, we draw a selective regime, which is now analogous to a topic, and draw a site from a multinomial distribution. The nice thing about it, once we realize this, we also realize that you don't actually have to do any MCMC. There are very, very fast iterative approaches for fitting all of these parameters, so now our method runs even faster, because we just picked the appropriate way to solve it from uh, machine learning literature. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, as it turns out, you can use this, uh, this exact uh, uh, analogy to um, develop other types of methods. So other methods which rely on accurate and fast estimation of a few dimensional set of parameters can be also done by uh, this LDA um, analogy. For example, we have uh, a fade method, which can be used to identify since some protein lines that are evolving directionally, and et cetera. In conclusion, um, hopefully I've given you a flavor of um, how we can use approximations and model specifications to greatly speed up data fitting without sacrificing statistical properties. I would argue that this is essential in, in, in the age of data abundance. Just to reiterate, data are being generated at faster rates um, than uh, computer speed is keeping up. There's only so much you can do to um, optimize the fundamental operation in this type of data analysis. Like basically, you know, uh, uh, you can't you know, you can't do better than BLAST and linear algebra. That's already optimized as far as it can be optimized, so you have to look somewhere else. So um, you basically need to come up with approximations or different tricks to just do fewer of these expensive calculations. Um, and um, the, uh, the claim that I would like to make is that what uses a method if it takes months or years to run in a typical data set? It's just not useful to practitioners. Um, all of the methods described are implemented in our software package, and um, we also have a, um, you know, allegedly user-friendly web server, which most of the biologists use, but you don't even have to run the package. You just click a couple of buttons, and all the analyses will be done for you. Um, and I would like to um, acknowledge my collaborators um, that are now all over the place. So most of this work was done at UC San Diego, um, but now you know I have collaborators at Temple, Cambridge, University of Western Ontario, a bunch of sequencing companies. Um, my graduate students seem to have uh, kind of spanned um, the sequencing um, so I got Pacific Biosciences, Lumina 10x Genomics, and Human Longevity, and my uh, funding primarily from the National Institutes of Health uh, in the US. And uh, I appreciate your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey. So um, could, you could ask a couple of questions. But before you ask your question, actually wait for me to come to you with a microphone. So, uh, who has a question? I was either amazingly good or amazingly <coughs> bad, so. Okay, so um, maybe I have a question like for the first, uh, regarding the first model you, okay. you, you presented, where you somehow iterate over the tree and try to estimate the 
the number of discrete rates that are required. Um, it, it seems like, you know, intuitively, my gut feeling would be that this might be prone to local maxima. Is, is this the case, and is this something that you, that you investigated? Right, so um, th th that's a great question. So um, it's, it's a greedy step-up procedure. And again, I, uh, I will just wash my hands off it and say um, that as variable selection at some point has done this. Um, fortunately for us, it doesn't seem to be too much of a problem, largely because um, as, you, as your branches become um, further and further from each other in the tree, they have less and less influence on one another. So they're basically kind of decoupling. So these variables have very, very weak interactions. Um, and uh, you know, at least based in simulated data, we do a good job. So we tend to, the, the issue here is, you know, we're concerned about um, both underfitting and overfitting. So, you know, we don't want to uh, allocate um, uh, rates to branches that don't require them and you know, similarly don't want to underestimate it. And it seems to be doing, you know, really well in simulated data. I don't have any theoretical justification for why it's happening other than the fact that I think it's just a bunch of weakly connected problems that don't really interact with one another that much. Uh, I have a question about the comparison between the first model and the FUBA model. What happens if you set the number of topics in the FUBA model to three? Does it lead to similar results? Uh, no, no, it actually works. There's basically, in order for this model um, to work reasonably well, um, so here, I'll see if I can do this. So if you look at the first um, plot here in the top, um, here, I'll, I'll highlight it. Um, so you have to put in enough points um, here, which would capture positive selection, here which would capture negative selection, and here which would capture neutral evolution. If you, if you only put um, your topics here, right, or here, then you basically are incapable of capturing a process that you're interested in. It would be similar to basically saying, you know, I want to classify scientific literature, but all of my topics are children's books. Um, you'll do something, right? But you won't ever be able to find anything. So you, but um, at 20 points, you actually, so, but it, what you do is if you don't need 20 points, you can actually do very similar results if you only put like five by five um, on, each, uh, um, on each axis. So you, you, you don't need that many points. I was thinking of something like for one topic would be like high, one topic would be like neutral, and one topic would be very low or something, and then you could have some agreement between those. I think that might, that just to I haven't it, tried that, yeah. it might, it might do something vaguely sensible, but my intuition that you need a, a, at least probably three in each dimension, so you need nine. Um, but yeah, I can try. Um, right? And then at this point, basically, uh, the, uh, the cost is, um, uh, the, the primary cost is actually doing all the preliminary work. Once you've fitted all the nuisance parameters, the rest of it is almost instantaneous. Um, so the, the key issue here is this only works if you have a couple of parameters, if you start adding dimensions to this, right, if you need to estimate this over three parameters, now you run it immediately into the curse of dimensionality because, you, need, you know, every time you add a dimension, you have to multiply the number of points. So at some point, it becomes nonsensical. So it kind of limits the applicability of these models. Um, but they, they seem to serve a very wide class of biologically relevant questions. More questions? Uh, if you would try to uh, apply this to tree search or, you know, f for this case where somebody was actually interested in the topology, uh, do you have any idea how you would discretize the topology space? Ooh, um, no. Um, I mean, last year I was at a workshop where people much smarter than me, like Susan Holmes, um, were talking about the ones I actually have done work on the topology of the tree space. Um, have, have try to explain to us what it actually looks like. Um, and um, all I remember from this is it's actually really difficult to um, have a good intuition of how far apart things are in the topological space. So all of your intuition about how to partition things into regions that you want to capture and how densely do you want to space these points, there is no intuition because you know small moves in some dimension might result in wild changes in topology. Um, and generally, I, I mean, whenever you go from continuous to discrete uh, parameters or you know, structure parameters, you know, these simple approximations tend to totally break down. Um, but in a way, if you think about it, you know, um, oh, no, no, that's not a good analogy. But, you know, the, the, the way, um, what I was going to say is that um, 
you know, traditional tree search, you know, which is started with an approximation and do refinement. Um, um, so presumably you could, you know, um, um, you might, no, no, that's not going to work. Never mind. More questions? Okay, so uh, maybe maybe one final question. So this is, I think this is probably one of the first applications of, of machine learning to phylogenetics. So the, the, the question would be, do you see other areas of phylogenetics where, where machine learning could be applied to help accelerate things or improve estimates? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are, right? So, um, I mean, we have uh, a few um, um, similar you know, methods that ask different types of questions in the same formalism, formal framework that we're going to develop and publish. But I think where it really um, you know, has the potential is to do um, what machine learning is good at, which is you know, finding patterns among biological data sets. So for instance, if you wish to, um, um, and I know uh, that um, you know, um, um, my former um, uh, colleagues at UCSD have done something like this. So you might imagine, um, so biological data themselves are structured and they're difficult to encode in a way um, that lends itself to um, machine-based classification. So for example, there's a gene a gene is just a box with letters, right? It's a collection of sentences um, that are all aligned. And there's a, you know, how do you encode it in a way that you can put into um, a machine learning classification algorithm? Um, so, uh, you know, for example, one of the things you could do, you can say, I have a gene, and I'm interested in how this gene evolves. So I'm going to take this gene, fit this process, and say, take this um, as a characterization of the gene. So now you've taken your gene, which is a structured text data, I've converted into a two-dimensional surface. And once you've converted enough genes into these two-dimensional surface, now you can run machine learning based on these two-dimensional surfaces. And um, basically, you know, a gene that has a similar selection profile will be clustered with another gene that's similar, that has a similar selection profile. And it's actually exactly what my colleagues have done. They've done this large-scale categorization of, you know, what do genes look like from the evolutionary perspective? And this is what a lot of modern bioinformatics is concerned with. You have a lot of independent data points, like genes, organisms, mutations, and you wish to ascribe, you know, classify them by how similar they are. Um, develop a predictive model which says, if I see another gene, um, what, what does it do, right? So you might imagine if you have, um, now if you have a gene which you, um, you don't know what it does, um, you could use this surface, you can extract a surface like this, and you can cluster it with genes that you already know, and you can, you can infer or impute um, some sort of function or selective regime that applies to this gene. So I think that's where, um, you know, the, the, the obvious machine learning applications are. Um, and, you know, um, um, I, what, what I do think, you know, if um, my, my own experience, so there were, there, were two th there were two things that I independently reinvented. So it was this one, um, which was, we didn't even think about it, it was basically just, you know, fast fitting. And the other one at some point I reinvented earth movers distance. Um, which is a convenient way to compare two discrete approximations. And you know, in the previous case, in the Earth movers distance, I knew that it had to be something that people have come up with. I just didn't know what to search for. And then I went to a machine learning conference and said, like, yeah, yeah, this is Earth movers distance. Um, so what I think we should all do as a computational biology community is to sort of have, um, you know, consciously um, uh, interact with um, the machine learning community and ask them the right kinds of questions, because. Um, yeah, the, the, the difficulties translating, you know, things into, um, into the same format. Uh, and and, and you know, once you do this, I think there's a lot of um, cross-pollination that can occur. Um, so um, I, it's not a very satisfying answer, but I think there's a lot more potential. Um, just, you know, it's not obvious to me exactly what it might be, um, other than these few small things. Thank you. So if there are no more, uh, Michael has a question. I can try. Uh, I, I work in NLP, and uh, we used LDA in like 2008, 9, 10. It, it was really hot. Uh, now it fell out of favor. Uh, everyone is doing neural networks. Uh, do you see something like this in your field as well? Uh, well, let's see. I, I want to be diplomatic about it. Um, So there, there's definitely uh, a lot of people are just seem to be keen to say we use deep learning for X. Um, I gener I'm generally cautious of this type of approach because it's replayed itself 
over and over, where there's a hot, whatever, you know, Bayesian statistics. You know, for instance, there was, you know, it was a trend to do Bayesian phylogenetics for everything in my field. Um, you know, for some cases, it's very well justified. For most other cases, it's not. And people can't explain why they do it or how they do it. So I think there's a danger that if you think about it, so there are people that understand what neural networks do. There are not very many of them. Um, there are people that understand what LDA does. It's, I, I don't count myself in either. I mean, I kind of know how I can use them. I don't really understand that well what they do. Um, but um, uh, uh, in my personal perspective is, you know, LDA is at least a generative model, or you know what it does. Neural network is just this general interpolation technique that gives you a black box. It might have better accuracy recall, but I tend to go back to interpretable results. Um, I'm sure we could use deep learning here. I, this seems to work just fine. I think uh, NLP is much more complicated because here we just have a very, very simple, uh, and it's a nice reduction to, an, uh, to um, LDA, what we do, but it's a very, very simple case of LDA. I don't think we need anything more complicated because we already know it works really well. Um, I would be very curious uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to actually think and, and talk to people that know about uh, deep learning of how to appropriately use it. Um, because trust me, I, you know, I come across, um, you know, it's very popular in grant applications now, and it's very clear that somebody picked up, you know, one review article of what um, deep learning is and said, we're going to use deep learning to solve all the problems in epigenetics or, you know, phenotypic prediction or disease classification, and then they don't actually tell you what they're going to do. Um, and if you read about deep learning, the devil's in the details like everywhere else. How do you structure the neural network? How do you do inference? How do you do validation? So I have, a, I have a lot of concern that people are just jumping on the bandwagon without understanding of what they're doing. And this is, this is not at all specific to deep learning. That's, that happens all the time when a new hot topic comes around. It's like, and and, and w this field is kind of late to catch on. Um, you know, so I, I would say a 10-year or an 8-year lag is respectable uh, you know, when it comes to uh, frontier um, statistical learning. But we do have other applications of uh, um, uh, uh, natural language processing, which we can talk about uh, later, because I, I know very little about natural language processing. I, I did build a stochastic uh, context-free grammar once, so that's all I can say about it. And, you know, I wrote an algorithm to do some inference about it. Thank you. So, if there are no further questions, uh, we should thank Sergey again for his last talk.